Nick, Nick's up at the beginning when the uh, course was set up with people with me there or not. Okay. So let's start. Let's start ah, the impossible. The impossible. Yes. You know, there's a lot of people quote I can remember say about only the impossible is worth doing. And I think they've even made it citing of the book. And um, well, I spent a lot of time with him, quite possibly more time than anybody else. And I'm sure he said it once, but I don't think he said it as a maxim for everybody all the time. It's not wasn't his style. I'm sure somebody, what he did do all the time was to push us to our limits. And I remember when, because at one point I was president of his charity work in France, Rockwa. And we do our very best doing all we could to raise money. And it was an effort. And we'd come and then we'd sponsor what, three, four, five projects. And he'd come back from Tibet and he'd say, I've got three more for you. And then we'd say, but we're milking everybody to the full. All of our volunteers are doing all they can. It's impossible. And in those kind of things, he might retort, well, you know, only the impossible is worth trying to show you that what we think of as the limits of our possibilities are in fact um, illusions. So anyway, uh, why it's impossible for me is that I've got years and years and years of study in my head about the three turnings of the wheel of Dharma, about the meaning of shunyata and voidness. And I want to squeeze it all into one hour without confusion. And it's just not possible. And I know in the past, sometimes in Sandaling, there have been whole weekends or a week or 10 day course, Christmas course. And even then, I don't get the feeling there's enough time to develop everything. So let's get going and let's start. Let's start beautifully. Let's start beautifully. Together, we're going to be together now for a few, for what, an hour, hour and a half. An hour of karma. Now, how much this hour of karma will benefit you um, depends entirely on your motivation and uh, your attention. Or, oh, by the way, to, I think I need to mute all your microphones because not everyone's muted. Okay. So, um, can you still hear me? Put a hand up. Yeah, good. Yeah. I mean, there'll be this screen in front of you with Ken talking away. And whether this makes good karma or bad karma for you, if you detest me and you think what a twit and he's got it all wrong and I don't like his hair and all the rest of it, then you could make an hour of really quite bad karma. I mean, because it's dharma doesn't mean it's necessarily good. If you have a piddling weak motivation, you might make an hour of piddling weak karma. If you have a beautiful love for each and every sentient being, however much you've ever loved anybody in your whole life, then you try and feel that way to every living sentient conscious being and think, here I really want to learn. I want to awaken my mind. I want to become a finer human being in every dimension. This is why I've come to this talk and it's really to make myself better so I have more to give to all of my fellow beings. Then if we can start with that feeling and then, and then try and maintain the feel of that all the way through, then there is no limit to the power to the significance of the karma you can make today. And especially today is about Buddha nature, Maitreya's teachings, Maitreya's becoming Buddha. Uh, it could be enough. It could be enough to sow a powerful seed for your own connection with these Buddha nature teachings in your next life and in lives to come. 
all the way up to that wonderful time when instead of meeting each other on Zoom, we'll be somewhere um, with Buddha Maitreya. Maybe we'll be evolved enough to look back and think, wow, thank goodness for that Zoom talk. We sowed the seed for this. Because like a snowball on the top of a mountain, or you know, like an acorn that makes a great tree. Tiny things, and it's in the karma teachings. It says small things can become very big. So let's have a good motivation, loving care for all beings. Sonje chodam, soje chodam la janjo madun dhani chapsun chi. Tagi jin so jipe sanam ji, prola penchara sanje droparan sho. Samchan tamche dewa dang dewe ju dang den parhan sho ji. Tunga dang tukma ji ju dang kra parhan sho ji. Tunga me pe dewa dang pa dang men kra parhan sho ji. Nirin cha dan me tan kra we. Tanyong Chempola ne Paranjurche. Alden saw a lama and voce, Dagi Chuara Pende Denshola. Kadrin Chempo Gone Jizonte, Ko Song Toche Madrop San Dunsur. I did uh, <coughs> a Zoom for the Cornwall group last um, Sunday and something was wrong with my setup and so the sound went really bizarre at times. So, <coughs> excuse me, and that's my sound <laughs> going bizarre. So if anything goes wrong, your microphones are on mute, but please wave a hand and then uh, we can stop and discuss it. Now, voidness. Last week, I gave you a definition of voidness. If we're in class together, then I'd ask you not to look at your notes and to repeat it to me, because I'm sure you remember. But if you don't, the thing you need to know, well, even though you're on mute, you can speak at home. I don't need to hear you. I want you to imprint something deep into your mind. So not just by listening, but by saying. And so please let me hear you. I see what I can see most of you. Okay. Please repeat this. Let's use the word voidness. We could say shunyata or emptiness. Let's, let's say shunyata. Shunyata is not a state. Let me see your lips moving. Shunyata is not a state. Shunyata is not a state. Are you saying it? Shunyata is not a state. Now we need to get this very, very clear. <clears throat> there are many states you can achieve through meditating where you will be totally quiet, where you can be totally spacious, where you can be totally cut off from your senses. So you're not seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, or touching. You are completely absorbed in a meditation state where nothing's happening. You can feel panoramic and spacious and all of these clever words you'll find in modern texts where they translate shunyata. These are all experiences. 
Some of them are very nice. In some of them, you feel very cosmic, very connected to the whole universe, their experiences. Shunyata is always, always one thing which is wisdom. It's not a state, it's not an experience. So, you know, if you think of spaciousness as a shunyata experience, then what happens when your mind is very tight and condensed? Is there no shunyata there? Shunyata is there all the time. And it means the wisdom that understands. The wisdom that understands. So last week we had the definition. Shunyata, voidness, emptiness, is the wisdom that understands, that knows immediately, that knows vividly the difference between what seems to be and what really is. The wisdom that knows the difference between what seems to be and what really is. Shunyata is always wisdom, wisdom. And in Vajrayana teachings, this is often represented, you know, the female form, consort, and then the male aspect, the counterpart, called skillful means, is what provokes that wisdom. It's the situation. You can't just be wise. I mean, please sit down for three seconds and be wise. What are you going to do? You can't just be wise. You have to be wise about something. And if your wisdom is shunyata wisdom, where you see the difference between the illusion and what's really going on, it needs something to provoke that. So this is why we have male and female in the very deep teachings and in the deep symbology of the mind. So shunyata is wisdom. It's always wisdom. And that wisdom knows the difference between the illusion and what's really going on. So we saw that the Buddha's presentation of Shunyata happened in three steps. We call the three turnings of the wheel of Dharma. And in the first one, which was a couple of weeks ago, then we saw that the seems to be the illusion is that there is a persona, a fixed me lasting me and in particular an eternal soul and buddha showed there isn't and in order to give the wisdom that penetrates that illusion and gets rid of it he showed what we really are that anyone can witness second by second through the five aggregates five heaps emotions feelings moments of perception, memory, the five senses at work. So by breaking down moment by moment, what we are witnessing, each what we are, what's happening just now, we can see we are this stream. So Buddha never said, you don't exist in the English sense of the word. There's nothing there. On the contrary, he showed that we will carry on existing and existing and existing in a changing interdependent way, not a fixed way, until we get out. That's the whole point. You'll reincarnate, you'll reincarnate, and you'll be the one feeling like you all the time. And it could go on endlessly unless we put a stop to it through wisdom. What causes the suffering and the main point of the Buddha's first turning of the wheel of Dharma is to get us out of the suffering we cause ourselves through the illusions we weave to ourselves, the me story we tell ourselves, the fixed feeling of identity. I need this to be happy. I had that, it's gone. Therefore, I feel sorry for myself. Now my life's no good anymore, I'm nostalgic. I see lots of people on Facebook, my age now, digging out the memories. Ah, oh, when I was a boy. And then, you know, I met him, I met her, and all of that kind of thing. The story of me that we weave, the more we make it solid, the more we can hurt. 
and the more we're liable to hurt others too. So Buddha gives us this vivid way of seeing what we really are. And then through this, not telling ourselves a story of eternal Ken or Ken with a soul, but seeing, yes, I think this, I actually do this, this is my motivation, and so on and so on. Buddha shows us what is virtuous in our mind, what is non-virtuous. He shows how we can meditate and tame the mind and get out of suffering. And in order to do that, the main tools he gives are this very clear scientific analysis of what's happening moment by moment in what we call me, or what we very reasonably call me, the stream of consciousness that we are. That's enough to get one person out of suffering. They come to understand themselves. Then, as we saw in the second turning of the wheel of Dharma, for those who are ready, for those who have the propensity for great compassion, loving care for other beings, and who also have the propensity for wisdom, a deeper wisdom, a deeper shunyata. Then we have those kind of teachings which say, okay, now you've used this five aggregates. You've seen moment by moment, oh, visual consciousness. What did you see? A banana. Mm. Desire. Banana desire. And then what did you remember? Oh, eating and, and so on and so on. We see moment by moment what's going on. We, and we've learned to label it consciousness, feeling, mental events, samskara, and so on. So Buddha shows what well, you know. That was a very useful set of labels to get you out of suffering. But those things, like the ego, well, look into it. See if you can find them. And so this is why we get the Heart Sutra, which says no I, no ear, no nose, no ear. It's the No No Sutra. <laughs> and so that's just the summary. And of course, he gave extensive teachings helping meditators to look into this labeling of all the components that make up our everyday existence to see how they in their own turn are ephemeral, big things in their big things. Karma, cause and effect, which he taught so extensively in the first term in the Wheel and Dharma. Now, when he says karma doesn't exist, it's not that he changed his mind. And now, oh, yeah, sorry, I've been teaching guys for about 30 years, karma, and uh, actually thinking about it, and what well, didn't really exist. He didn't mean it like that. He means that just like ego, relatively, as far as we're concerned, from the way we experience and the way we see life, there are causes that produce results. But he said, just look into it. Try and find the actual production. So if I carry on this sentence any further, we're here till half past and we're finished. Because we go into Nagarjuna's reasoning, which is a much finer analysis of the way that we are perceiving reality and telling the story of reality to ourselves to see how those stories can be relatively incredibly useful because karma, we definitely need to know about it. But then when we penetrate what really it is, it's not quite what we thought in the first place. Shunyata is the wisdom that sees the difference between what we thought was the truth and what's really going on. Last week we went there briefly and I don't know how much I developed the idea, but out of all of that, many, many, many scores of understanding of the Buddha's teaching developed from Nagarjuna's teachings and his disciples and then divergences of opinion and so on and so on. Different inflections. So two main streams emerged. One is mind only, where we learn that everything is mind. 
Now that is opposed to the schools based on the first turning of the wheel of Dharma, where they had, as we had in Europe for thousands of years, a model of reality based on mind and matter, a universe that exists materially and an intelligence that perceives that universe. A universe that exists materially, atoms, and they talked about atoms at the time of Buddha. It's quite, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And in Greece as well, they had the atomists in Greece. And at the time of Buddha, this idea, uh, they didn't have machines that we've got, but they thought, and they had an incredible logic. Let me divert. I, I can't call him a friend. He's somebody I had the privilege of knowing, um, a very, very famous uh, Tibetan called Pun Sol Wanjian. He, when the uh, Chinese came to Tibet, he was the person who um, was a translator, but not just a translator, was the interface between the Dalai Lama and the Chinese authority. And he was a physicist by training. And then uh, he was put in prison for a long time. He trained in Buddhist logic. And in prison, he amused himself by applying his Buddhist, I don't know if you can amuse yourself in a prison there, but anyway, by applying Buddhist logic to his knowledge of physics. And he produced a work that proved, combining those two, it's fascinating, Buddhist reasoning and his own knowledge of physics to prove there must be liquid water on the moon. So a few years ago, maybe it's 10 years now, because uh, at one point we were asked to translate his book about that. Um, when America started talking about water on the moon, China suddenly realized that they had this guy in prison who'd written a thesis about liquid water on the moon. And um, that did him a lot of good. Anyway, at the time of Buddha, and later at the time of Nagarjuna, they were talking about atoms making up a material universe because they thought very deeply and they also had a meditation mind which has superpowers, which also picks up stuff. And they were talking about the nature of atoms. And then this intelligence that we have that perceives the material world. And when they explain karma, they have to explain how what we do influences the fabric of material reality to create future realities. It's like programming. So in the second turning, the mind only school says, no, not mind and matter. Just mind. Just mind. Just consciousness. Matter is an experience of consciousness. But that's all. So our modern physics went that way um, for a bit, talking with my few friends who are quite advanced physicists. They say, no, that's, they've gone back now. They're looking more into a mind-matter model. But anyway, this idea that all is mind, everything is consciousness, gave rise to the mind-only school, Yogacharya school, and so on, where everything, including the five aggregates, is now presented as an experience of consciousness. Everything's mind. Now, that, as far as what is mind, what is my mind, what is the greater mind, how do minds interact, what is the role of love and compassion, as well as wisdom within mind, what did, what did the Buddha actually achieve, all in terms of mind. It's incredibly workable. It's powerful, deep teachings. And the deeper Tibetan traditions, Mahamudra and Dzogchen, kind of kidnapped the mind-only schools, ideas, and upgraded them a bit. But it's a very, very workable system. But then, they also developed the second main trend from the 
go to the second phase of teaching and that is called the middle way or Majjhimaka. Middle way does very much to mind only what Buddha did to the idea of ego. It says, hmm, hmm, everything's mind. Hmm. Mind does this. I, now, I, in all my years at Samuelin, uh, I had very painful ears because I would walk along the corridors and hear newcomer pundits explaining Dharma to even newer newcomers. And sometimes what you hear them saying will make you go, ouch. You don't say anything, you just walk by and leave them to get on with it because corridors aren't the place to explain Dharma. But you'd hear people saying, ah, but mind does this and mind does that. Your mind's doing this and mind can do it. And the nature of mind and the potential of mind, 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 mind drives you by me. You hear it so much. So the middle way say, I don't, just a minute. This mind you're talking about, what is it? No, not it does this and it does that, but what is it that's doing all of that? Can you tell me? Can you show me? Is there anything at all anywhere that you can say, ah, that's it. That's the mind I'm talking about that does all of this. And of course they've got them. Nobody ever did. There should be a 10 million pound reward or euros for the first person who finds mind. The third come up in this Mahamudra prayer says, even the Buddhists have never seen it. So if all of your conversation is based on mind does this, mind does that, and nobody ever found mind, it's a bit embarrassing. It's a little bit embarrassing. It's like talking about I this, I that, and what do you mean by I? And you see that the I isn't fixed. So the wisdom goes deeper. And Majjhimaka philosophy, which has its own different schools and levels, is about as deep as the thinking gets. And the conclusion is that, well, there are two main levels of middle way thinking. One is that everything is interdependence. And you'll hear this a lot, You'll hear our present come up in Tassitupa talking about this a lot. Nothing is fixed because everything depends on everything else, and all the everything else's depend on other everything else's, and the whole thing doesn't stand still even for a split second. It's like trying to catch quicksilver. But nevertheless, in the truth of the relative world, relative truth, not relative lies, relative truth, what is true to us relatively, one thing leads to another and everything depends on other things to be what it is. That's the meaning of shunyata. Nothing exists in its own right because everything is changing all the time and depending on other things to be what it is and they're changing all the time. So this flow, this beautiful miracle liquid of life that changes all the time and where everything is connected and interrelated in so many ways. The wisdom that sees that is the shunyata. It's not some kind of empty, void, spacious state. It's the wisdom that is really crystal clear about what's going on through the interdependence in your thoughts, in your experience, in what's coming in through your senses in your understanding itself. Wisdom. Wisdom is shunyata. And that wisdom can only be provoked by the play of interdependence. So that's how you get the male, the female, the two sides in Madhuryana. Now, today we come on to the third turning of the wheel of Dharma and the Buddha nature teachings. And what you need to know in brief, very brief, so you've got it clearly. Three turnings of the wheel of Dharma. First one, a negation, negation of ego, of self. Second one, 
a negation of any idea of anything fixed, anything that has fixed entity, whether it be a persona for people or anything, all of the thing. The word for thing in Sanskrit is Dharma. Dharma. So the nature of anything is not fixed. Everything depends. So a negation of our fixed ideas. That goes so far because Nagarjuna, he takes apart so many fixed ideas. You're left kind of stripped at the end of it. You've got nothing to cling to. That's wonderful if you can take it. But don't take it apart unless you can take it. <laughs> You're better off with some kind of fixed illusion that works for you and makes you a good human being and taking apart all the illusions too quickly and then being um, not a well, not a well functioning human being and not much use to other human beings. But anyway, second turning of the wheel of Dharma, negation. No, 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 no. And we call those shunyata or emptiness because things are devoid of the apparent reality they seem to have. Devoid of it. No, it's not that. No, it's not that. But the third turning of the wheel of Dharma is an affirmation, not a negation. It affirms our Buddha nature. Now, the first two turnings of the wheel of Dharma were very necessary for that to happen. Because if Buddha asserted Buddha nature from the start, people would have got it, they'd have taken all their habitual projections, their fixed ideas, their own stuff, and they would immediately have translated what the Buddha was saying into, oh, that's, that's ego, that's me, or whatever it would be. It's only when one has, through meditation or through study, or ideally through meditation and study, acting as friends for each other. It's only when one has worked extensively to see through one's own delusions and understand the truth of all these teachings of the Buddha about Shunyata, that the mind is clear stable, quiet, not jumping to conclusions at every instant. There is the space for the Buddha to say, now you are no longer deluded to show you the truth of what we call mind, truth of everything. And we call that our awakened or enlightened nature. Buddha nature. So historically, it's said that the Buddha nature teachings came from sutras or discourses given by the Buddha towards the end of his teaching time, uh, maybe within the last five, 10 years of his life. We can pinpoint some 10 or 15 sutras, some of them more extensive than others about Buddha nature. But where we get our own particular um, teachings from, on Buddha nature are from Maitreya. So if we put it in sort of simple, maybe a bit too simple, but simple historical terminology, we see when the Buddha taught back there in India, he had his worldly disciples and they mainly got the non-ego message. But he also had beings we can't see, like Nagas and Devas, but also great Bodhisattvas. And oh it's, oh, it's such a pity. I'm looking at my clock. We don't have time. But I wish I could tell you about the Prachaka Buddhas. It's not very useful. There are none in this world at the moment. And they, we just find them in the scriptures. But I have to tell you, I can't stop myself, excuse me. At one point in the Buddha's teaching, 
Now just imagine there's the Buddha. He quickly develops his Sangha. You've got all these people they're wearing. Now they've got a bit of cloth. They're learning to meditate. They're learning right conduct, morality. It's a community. Some of them are the superstars of the community. They're better meditators. They've got the ideas sorted out. They can battle them off. They can teach others and so on. But all of that is contributing to a development towards Buddhahood. And that kind of shines and radiates from you, the person. So at one point, a whole load of Pracheka Buddhas turned up, shining, radiant with bodies of light. It must have been quite disturbing, I think, for the community, because sort of where did these guys come from? And how come, you know, we've been listening, we've been there for nearly all the Buddha's teaching, we've been practicing like stink, we got this far, and then all of a sudden, where, so then the Buddha explains, they came from the time of the previous Buddha, and they had meditated, and for us they're an example, because it shows how shamatha, if you get stuck in it, can be incredibly long-winded. Because once your mind gets absorbed, you're gone. You're gone. And you can be gone for a long time. So the mind can become very fine and very quiet and quieter and quieter. And it's very, very nice. Uh, but it's a big detour as far as becoming Buddha is concerned. But nevertheless, these Prachaka Buddhas have developed amazing wisdom about interdependence. So much so, it said that when they were, their bodies died and they were reborn, as little children, they'd see like dead bones and an animal by the roadside. And all of a sudden, the 12 links of interdependence would come back. They think that's death. There's death because there's birth. There's birth because there's this. They'd leave. They go off into the woods. They know their meditation came back spontaneously and they were gone again, absorbed, died, <laughs> reborn. And so they came back. I think it must have hit them. <laughs> I, I, I know too many Buddhist communities, but I think seeing a whole load of superstars turn up when you were doing pretty good until then must have been quite upsetting. I hope not, but I can well imagine it. Anyway, so the Buddha taught bodhisattvas, and among them he taught Manjushri. And Manjushri inspired Nagarjuna to go to the Naga realm and get the teachings of the second turning of the Wheel of Dharma. He taught Bodhisattva Maitreya, and Maitreya was the inspiration for a very great being called Asanga. You don't tend to hear Asanga's name as much as Nagarjuna, but for us he's perhaps more important than Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna was, let's say, second, third century. Asanga was more like fourth century, fifth century. So now uh, Asanga's teachings were about Buddha nature. Asanga's story is brilliant. We don't have time for it, but he spent 12 years in retreat. And uh, at the end of that, he became one with Bodhisattva Maitreya, Buddha Maitreya and received five great texts. And now a lot of my life, has gone into translating those texts. And for these Buddha nature teachings, um, published three times in Samaling. First, a direct translation of Maitreya's work, Asanga's work. Next, what they call a sikro, so a translation with just a few words added to make more sense of the poetry. And then based on the explanations of Tatsutupa and Trangul Rinpoche, uh, with this book, Maitreya on Buddha nature, which has, I hope, very user-friendly explanations for each point. It's a treasure of a work. It really is. It tells you everything you need to know about Buddha nature. So Asanga got five main treaties. Or what his teachings became five main treaties, distilling Bodhisattva or Buddha Maitreya's work. And one of them was this 
to Kampura Naricha, called the Mahayana Uttara Tantra Shastra. Now, that was taught. It seems to have been taught in quite a limited, secret way. So now if we go forward to the time of just before Martha, the translator, to India, we get this amazing teacher called Maitripa, who in the Kaju lineage is one of the great forefathers. Mapa had two main gurus in India, Naropa and Maitripa. From Naropa, he got all of the yogic teachings, the six yogas and so on, many, many, many teachings. But from Maitripa, he got the Mahamudra transmission from Salaha. Maitripa was uh, a Mahasiddha and to cut his story short, he was very connected to future Buddha Maitreya. But there were, he knew there was something missing. And at one point he was circumambulating a stupa. It was an old stupa with a crack and all of a sudden he saw inside, it was like brilliant light shining to the point where he had the stupa opened up. Now it's quite something you don't normally go opening up stupa, I don't know how you get permission or quite how you do it. But inside that stupa had been hidden since the time of the Sangha. This Buddha nature text that I, I took about 17 years work on and off on into producing this way. It's a big thing for my life, big thing. So he saw the light shining, he opened the stupa, he took out the text about Buddha nature, and as he read it through memory and through divine transmission, each word, each meaning became crystal clear, and then through him this became spread. So the Buddha nature teachings, um, how can we sum them up? If we follow Gampapa's example, and not just as teachings out there that we need to know about, what we need to know for ourselves, because that's what all the Buddha's teachings are here for. Gampapa sums it up as three, three points. And so, and well, let's not go into the structure of Maitreya's work, but anyway, three points about Buddha nature. One is every sentient being has it. Well, a stone doesn't have it, a brick doesn't have it, but every sentient being with a mind, no matter how in this moment, how confined or primitive or simple that mind may be, has Buddha nature. That's the teaching. And seeing lives as part of an endless story of karma and reincarnation even if somebody is reborn just now as a slug or a sentient being that doesn't have, as far as we can tell, much of a mind. That's just a passing result, rebirth of karma. And who knows when that's over in their next life, they might be the new Einstein. So we see our fellow sentient beings as all having this Buddha nature. Everyone has it. It's a very important point. Everyone, even amongst our human, the worst, the ones who do the most evil, they have Buddha nature. That's the first point. Everyone has it. And there's a whole logic behind that we don't have time to go into, but the logic is that Dharmakaya is omnipresent and Dharmakaya is that Buddha nature. The second point is that everyone has it the same. So there's no sort of platinum grade Buddha nature in the Kamapa and a bronze level Buddha nature in me, for instance. We all have Buddha nature 
the same. It's the same in everybody. What this, what we talk about is Buddha nature. So the good news, every sentient being is basically Buddha. The same, Buddha nature, the same. Another bit of good news. The third point, you can see it coming, is a but, it's a however. The not so good news is that, well, it's presented as good news. It's very interesting. It's presented in a very positive, very hopeful way. So it says, therefore, there is potential. All beings have Buddha nature. All beings have Buddha nature the same. Therefore, there is potential. Huh? What does that mean? Yes, potential. Because, you see, Buddha nature is there, the same in each and every one of us, but it's covered up. It's covered up. And if it's very, very, very covered up, then it's there in theory, but it can't manifest at all. And all of our Bodhisattva is about taking away what covers up this intrinsic nature. So that explains many things. You know, sometimes you'll see it written or you'll hear it said, you are Buddha. And the core essence of mind is true. That's who we really are. The rest is illusion covering it up. But what Kampopa tells us is that that illusion, what covers it up, can be so heavy and so confused that in fact it's adding more and more layers of covering and taking you worse and worse. People who do lots of evil make lots of bad karma and so on. They can go down and down and add more and more layers covering up the Buddha nature. And our Dharma path is to help us understand not to do the harm, how to benefit each other and be kind, how to cultivate meditation and be serene how to do all the things that are peeling off the layers so that the light can start to shine through potential. So we see, as far as we're concerned, and our fellow beings we observe, we respect the Buddha nature that's in them all. We think of them as, because of that, future Buddhas. We need to be as realistic as we relatively can about what's going on just now. And because of the nature of reincarnation, we think of them as past best friends, past mothers, past parents, future Buddhas. And we try to relate to the goodness. So then those three points are very general. It's there in everyone, it's the same in everyone, and it's what gives the potential. Working with the relative delusions can uncover it or cover it up more. But what is then this Buddha nature, this awakened nature? Maitreya tells us it has three main qualities. Three main qualities. I think many of you have come across this great Dharma called Chensi Rinpoche, Dugo, Dugo Chensi, or the first great Chensi a few hundred years ago. Chen and Tse are the Tibetan words for the first two of these qualities. Chen is wisdom, perfect wisdom, total clarity that knows anything because there's nothing coming up the works. There's no projections, there's no pre-assumptions. The mind is infinitely vast and can know anything that comes before it or misses. Jen, wisdom. Second quality is Tse, compassionate love or loving compassion for each and every being. Not an artificial compassion, spontaneous, natural, but inseparable from the wisdom. There's a very, very, very beautiful Tibetan saying. It's Tong Ni Ninjin Nimpoche, which means shunyata, or the wisdom that has compassion 
as its heart essence. It's not that there are really two things, it's that the wisdom is compassionate wisdom. And that compassion is wise compassion, and you can't separate those two. It says it's not like black and white threads wound together. They're inseparable. The wisdom is always loving. The love is always wise. Now, if we take them as two, from our point of view, as observers and using words, then they give rise to a third thing, which is power. Wisdom, compassion, power. And that is a power to help any mind which is open to the help. And this is one of the differences between the idea of a savior and Buddha and a Buddha. A Buddha or a Lama cannot save you. What they can do is according to your degree of receptivity, openness, help you acquire the tools to help yourself, to awaken yourself. I mean, if all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas with their beautiful minds and loving intentions could save us, we wouldn't be here. We'd have been saved thousands of years ago because there's certainly lots of love and wisdom. We have potential. And so the power of the Buddha is to help awaken and develop that potential when the circumstances are right. So these three qualities, wisdom, clarity, and love, and power, are seen as the core nature of our being if you want to say of your mind, if you use the word mind, that has always been there, is there right now, and will always be there and will never change. When we looked for a title for the first version of the Sangha's work, we asked Trangor Rinpoche and he said, in the end, he came up with the changeless nature. Buddha nature is changeless. Here right now is the truth of you. It's the truth of this mind, but covered up. So we are naturally loving and wise. And so the Buddha nature teaching shows that that is there. They help us understand how to awaken it. And that once it's becoming awake step by step, the qualities that emerge as we peel off the layers. Is Dharma actually, and our Dharma practice, is destructive, not constructive. Because all we need to do is to remove the illusions, to remove the darker things, the things that hurt us and hurt others. We take away, and then the love which is natural to mind can shine more and more. And the loving wisdom, not conceptual wisdom, not ideas, not cold knowledge. The knowledge that can only come when there's love and goodness. A certain wealth of goodness in your being through the practice of kindness and the practice of serenity and so on. When that's there, then the loving wisdom can come out. So our Dharma practice is destructive. To illustrate the potential, a Sangha, and then Maitripa, and this work gives us nine beautiful examples. And at first, they're just nine examples of how something can be so amazing, yet covered up. And then once they're unpacked even more, we see how the nine examples relate to nine stages of our own development towards enlightenment. 
Uh, we don't really have time for the stories, but um, let me tell you some of them. The first one's the weirdest story. It's, it's a, an actual Buddha, a little being of light, who's imprisoned inside a lotus flower. So that must be in a little pond somewhere or a puddle. And the lotus flower is rotting. And there's a passerby. And there is some kind of spirit that's clairvoyant. And the spirit tells the passerby, you'll never believe this. But you see that stinky, rotting lotus over there. There's a Buddha inside that. And if you peel away the lotus, you'll meet the Buddha. Fortunately, the passerby took it seriously. Went over and peeled away the rotting petals. And there there was shining Buddha of light. So this first example is about desire, attachment, clinging, clinging to our fixed ideas, clinging to other people, clinging to things, clinging to refuge, clinging. And when we cling at first, something is so attractive or somebody is so attractive. So it's like a beautiful flower, nothing more beautiful in the whole world. You see on Facebook so many pictures of flowers. But then just as it's nothing so beautiful, when the flower starts to rot and stink, there's nothing more than you want to get rid of it. So the nature of desire is at first it's very enticing and pulls you in, and very promising. But very often it goes wrong. So within the process of desire and attachment and clinging on all of its levels, all the time Buddha nature has been there. So if we can pull away that rotting flower of habits of desire, then we'll find Buddha. The second one, so it's something wonderful, a Buddha inside something that doesn't seem wonderful, a rotting flower. Second example is that of honey, surrounded by a very angry swarm of bees. So when you see a swarm of bees and they're not looking to I used to look after the bees in Samiling in the early 70s. They were given to Samiling because they were very aggressive and the person wanted to get rid of them. So it was a poison gift. So, you know, when they're looking kind of dangerous, then you wouldn't want to go near it. But within that cluster of bees is delicious honey, which was something very treasured before it was produced industrially as a medicine, as a food, as something very rare. So like that, we get a whole example of how a skilled beekeeper can get the honey without being stung. So this is an example for anger and aggression and hostility in the mind. All the time, Buddha nature's there. The wisdom, the beauty, the peace, the power. But we cover it up with ego battles, fights, hostility, and dislikes. So if we become skilled, we can manage to reach the pure nature of our mind, even though the habits of anger are there. And then there's a third example of grains inside their husks. These nutritious grains are in, it's not very good for People who like brown rice and whole foods these days. But in the old example, they said, you know, useless to eat unless you take the husks off. So the husks represent ignorance. But then we get two more examples which are very vivid. One of them, and you can just picture it if you've traveled in not so well off countries, is one of these places on the edge of a village where the rubbish has been left and built up generation after generation, a pile of rotting, filthy rubbish. Maybe you've seen some of those. But at one point, a big piece of gold was dropped in the rubbish. Nobody knew. 
and then generations, centuries of rubbish built up on top of it. And it's the same story, same idea. Somebody tells somebody, you'd never believe it, but if you go through that filthy pile of rotting rubbish, you'll find gold and that can change your life. So this represents all the mind poisons in their active state. They're unpleasant, they're poisonous, they don't do us any good. But if we can work and understand them and understand the mind that's doing those has as its core nature this changeless Buddha mind, then we can find the gold, the treasure. So like that, we have many examples of the way Buddha nature is there, but unrecognized, and how it is very valuable. And then in Asanga's teachings, he shows us that once we have found and taken away what is covering our Buddha nature, which is the path which would probably take many lifetimes. If you're very optimistic in Vajrayana, they say maybe one or three or seven or perhaps 16 lifetimes if you really just give every 24 hours of your day to it. Or if you do like the Buddha, three cosmic eons or however long it takes. The real taking away of the layers that cover our Buddha nature so we become 100% totally wisdom, love and compassion, power, the real peace and a state of peace take a long time. So they show us it's there, but once it has been unveiled and as it's being uncovered through the body of the levels, then the activity is spontaneous, doesn't need any thinking or any planning. It is spontaneous and thought free. So then Maitreya gives us nine examples for that. Please read them in the book. They're, they're wonderful examples of like the sun that ripens everything and brings warmth and light all over the world to all different beings. And of the nine examples, the last one is the earth that supports us all, that supports the growth, coming, the going, the living, the dying, the walking backwards and forwards, everything. And it says none of the nine examples can really fully convey the activity that can come from this awakened Buddha potential. But of all the nine examples, the earth is perhaps the best, this ground of everything. So now I've come past the time. I was thinking about these teachings and it's why there's a new Zoom course coming along, which shows us the difference between consciousness, life as we experience it, and this Buddha wisdom. So I've put um, adverts for those uh, on Facebook. And I think it's a very, very, very fascinating topic to uh, explore. So now that's the hour of the talk. Mm, it goes too quickly. But let's dedicate anything that was good and then we can stay together for a while. Uh, if you have any points you'd like to make or any questions you'd like to ask. Let's share this with all of our fellow beings, everyone in this world, all the human, all the animals, and then throughout the infinite cosmos. Let's, with great love and care, for there to be peace and harmony and serenity. Let's dedicate whatever was good as our gift, and also so that we don't cling to, cling to it. We just learn to let go, move on. So non dia tonche zikpani, tonne nyepi dranom ponche ne, cheka na che pala kukpa ye, sete sole dro, dro shu. Chancho sancho rinpo che, ma che panam je jurche, Jepa nyampa mepa da kongye kongyu ta wada.
Thank you. So now you can um, unmute your microphones and I need to put you so that I can see more of you. Oh, there you are. So uh, I don't know about uh, Google things, but I'm recording this. So just now I've switched the screen so I can see. The <laughs> So if you don't want to be seen, you need to turn your camera off. Uh, yes, Neil. I, yeah, uh, I remember a long time ago when uh, Tai C. Tupa was teaching in Samueling and someone expressed this seemingly impossibility or take forever and forever and forever to a achieve this revealing of one's Buddha nature. And I remember Tai Si Tuba just sort of like smiled the way he does and then said, oh, said, uh, if you just strive to be 10% better in this life. 1%, he said, 1%. Was it 1%? Oh. It is 1%, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then he said, like, and do that every lifetime. Then he said, it'll be, it'll happen so quickly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, uh, the maths is interesting. So you don't need to think too much about like compound interest and things that should go along. But he said, if you improve 1% in this life, then in a hundred lives, you're Buddha. And that's pretty good. And also the good thing is, I mean, the main point of that is um, each life is a little bit better. And this is a little bit better. And that's, that's really the idea. It's uh, to be going in the right direction, however long it takes. And it's the hardest thing is to be a beginner because you're in the dark, but so much is a question of faith and making choices where you don't know if you're making the right choices. Once you've meditated enough and the understandings assimilated enough, it makes its own sense. It couldn't be any other way. Beginner's the hardest. So this thing of it's even a bit better and the next life's even a bit better and you have more stability and more natural insight and you have a naturally kind of disposition towards other beings and so on. It's a wonderfully hopeful message he gave. So thanks for, thank you very much for mentioning it. Yes, Can I ask on. a question? Yes. Hi. Um, Hi thank, how are you? Fine. Um, thank you. First of all, Thank you for the teachings, they were really good. And I can't wait to listen to it again on YouTube because you said some very interesting things. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh -huh. um, so I, I'm just really confused. So like I, I listened to what you said about in nature and I'm going to research that more and thank you for explaining that. Um, but I just, so like I'm trying to do my nondro just trying in my prostrations but like I just don't understand about Vajradhara so like you're saying that you know it's not a state this shunyata and stuff but we're praying to attain the state of Vajradhara then like is Vajradhara one singular being or one single Buddha or is it a state and then who did Talopa receive the teachings from if it is not one single Buddha yeah. Does that make sense? Here is, yeah, he did. And Tilopa's story is perhaps it's perhaps the best way to explain this. Although when Taisitupa was teaching about Vajradhara in Samiling, he was, I mean, he was very the word, bemused. He was saying, you know, how, how can anyone say what Vajradhara is? Because by very definition, Vajradhara is beyond. So Tilopa is famous because he had, he studied in, they say, in, in the four directions. He went to the north of India, the east, the south, the west. He went to the best gurus. He had more than 100, more than 100 gurus in India. And he received these teachings, these tantric teachings, this bit of yoga stuff and so on. And he put them all together. That's why we get this famous six yogas that he taught in Europa. Uh, he assimilated what was in so many different transmissions and traditions, and he got to the heart that's behind all of them. Now, some of them have got Buddhas with so many arms, so many faces, 
some it's simple, some it's complicated, some look completely weird. And he could see the same thing going on with these different manifestations. And then at one point, because of his own meditation, Tilopa met Vajradhara, not out there like he met the other gurus, but by meeting the pure nature of his own mind. So this pure nature of our mind, which in itself has no form, it is pure love, and love has no shape, no form. It is pure wisdom, wisdom, when you're wise and you just simply know, has no shape, no form. This power to be there for other beings and help and guide them has no shape, no form. Yet, the wonder of this pure nature, changeless nature of mind, is like that of a diamond, it's why we use a diamond. It's just a carbon structure, very simple, but you turn it once there's light shining, and you start to turn a cut diamond, you see blue, you see red, you see different patterns. So this purity that's in our mind, which is beyond form, manifests as form in our relative mind. It can show its love by showing us Jimrezi. It can show the power to protect by manifesting its Tara. And it can show the inner nature of our mind in its purity by manifesting a form of Vajradhara. And when you see that form, the forms speak immediately to you. You don't need a book about symbols and saying, oh, you know, Vajradhara has got the hands like this. What does that mean? When you look at this hand and that hand, you know, it said when people looked at the Buddha, um, they saw this mound on the Buddha's head, which when people saw it, they could never see the top of it. They felt immediately the devotion that the Buddha had had to his teachers over all of his previous lifetimes. They felt the faith, the openness, without anybody needing to tell them. So when we see Buddha Vajradhara, every part of Vajradhara, Vaityana Buddha crown, the way the hands are held, the union of wisdom and skillful means, and the legs is meditation being the basis through which we come to recognize the nature of our own mind. It is a spontaneous manifestation that Tilopa found deep in his own meditation. And afterwards, he said something which is outrageous in India. You know, he's in India. In India, and even these days, you know, when we meet people, one of the things they'll ask you is, who is your guru? And people are very proud to say, ah, oh, my guru is Baba Sans, or whatever it is. He said, I, Tilopa, have no guru meaning no human guru. My guru is Vajradhara, which meant that he'd met the purity of mind, that is changeless, that is everywhere, that is omnipresent through time and space, and that all of his teachings came directly from that. So when we take refuge and we do the prostrations, then what we are prostrating to is the truth of mind in the way it manifested to Tilopa, and in the way that when, after you've done your prostrations and however far you get, when you come to discover the truth of your own mind, all that and all of us, at that moment, you will feel the wisdom and the compassion and the power, but it will manifest in that beautiful form of Buddha Vajradhara, a thousand times more meaningful than in any painting. I don't know if that helps at all. Thank you. <laughs> it does. So Thank actually, you when we take refuge and when we do the prostrations, if you really, really look into it, what are you taking refuge in is yourself, the truth yeah. of yourself. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I've got two screens of people still, I think. Yeah. So you can activate, if I can't see you waving a hand, then you can use voice. Or, we're coming to the end of dummies. Again, this is Carl. Hello, Carl. Maybe your, book is, your, your wonderful book is sold out, I see. It's not available anymore. 
Yeah, it's one of those things where if you look on Amazon, you see you can get one for nine hundred pounds from a book yes. somewhere. Um, look, it's a lot of work for me, but I do have some. And if you're desperate for one, I think it's you can go online and probably download it. In fact, I, no, I'm just remembering. Sorry, I put it online so you can download. Okay, on your website, uh, Kim. Ah, uh, where did I put it? Uh, I did. Um, I'll send you a link. I'll put a link up. Lovely. Because Thank you point, so much. Because exactly, exactly that. Uh, people couldn't get it. And um, some of the shops shut now with the lockdown. It has been for most of the year. So um, I do have some hard copies that I can send. Although going to the post office now is quite a problem here. But um, you can download it and then um, print it out or read it. Read it. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, silence is wonderful. It's beautiful, but it means then I let you all go. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed this Dummies course. It's been very frustrating because I would have said so much more. And uh, my enemy is the clock that goes around far too quickly. But it's been nice to share what's been there. I hope it can encourage you to uh, explore what we've seen together uh, a little bit more. Take good care of yourselves, please. And uh, those of you who are in Dharma, please practice. Um, there's nothing quite like doing those prostrations or doing the meditation. It's what we all need to do as much as we can. So thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, Ken. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye. Bye. Bye Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Until the next time. Yeah. Ken, I have one simple question that isn't related to the talk oh, yes sir was good i was just about um in the bookcase behind <laughs> you over your left shoulder My there is a book yeah i'm i've been fascinated by what that book is because i kind of recognize it but i'm not secret sure. it's secret <laughs> it says mahamudra on it i think no um what it is is a translation of mahamudra uh, ocean of certainty or ocean of definitive meaning um, that is uh, done under the auspices of Dzogchen Pundok Rinpoche. Um, right. And it's translation from, who did that? I think it was, yeah, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Callahan who did this. Okay. But it's only for people, it's actually, it's not a book for people, it's a book for teachers. Book for teachers. So um, uh, it's actually not helpful for people past a certain point. You're better off not knowing. We're tricky customers, most of us. Right. So, I think I think actually I hadn't realised it was Zogton, Zogpon, Anyway, um, I think I may have it actually. That's probably why I recognise it, and I don't look at it very often now. <laughs> yeah. Well. Um, it's but anyway, one, that's it. It's the one that has you know the. The Mahamudra that Taisitu was teaching in yeah, India. Yeah, that's fine. I knew I recognised. He's going through this, yes. Yeah, I knew I recognised the cover from somewhere, but mm. it's months and months since I picked it up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and it's fine. To, it's fine to use it up to about chap up to about section fifty one, but then yeah. after that, it's not helpful because um, it should be stuff the teacher knows. Just individual yeah we think to take you by surprise and ask you questions that you weren't expecting we <laughs> so. were we were told that the up to chapter section 45 was anyway was beyond yeah. that 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 is a much more individual teaching not a group teaching not yeah group. that's right and it's not helpful to know i think one of the best things that ever happened to me was to come into dharma before the books were published i think there were only yeah. Maybe yeah. five or six books altogether when we first started. Yeah. No, they, and they were old stuff. It was stuff from Lama Govinda and mm -hmm. so on. And 
we didn't have any references. We had not a clue what we were getting into. When we no. started learning prostrations, there was nothing to turn to, to see, you know, a book so you could read about it. It was only directly from the teacher. Mm. And it was amazing being naive yeah. like that and in the teacher's hands. And people have access to so much information now and advanced stuff. And if, you're, if you do have a path in the teacher, sometimes it's more of a hindrance than a help. In the yeah. 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 Yes. Thank you. Hey, Ross. Take good care. Thank and you, you too.